like Happy, right? Pharrell Williams' song Happy? Well, what if I told you that that song almost didn't exist? Mainly because Pharrell Williams almost didn't exist. And all because of a decision someone made way back in 1832. Let me show you what I mean. I'm a genealogist and I like to look into the family trees of people I admire. So I decided to do this with Pharrell and discovered that his family has been firmly planted in Virginia and North Carolina for centuries. I also found some interesting names such as China, Kane, Fenner, General, Hilliard, and my favorite, Napoleon Bonaparte, known to his friends as Bone. But of all his ancestors, it was Ambrose Hawkins who caught my attention. He was born about 170 years before Pharrell and was just one of his 64 fourth great-grandparents. So why obsess on him? Well, he was from Halifax County, North Carolina, and here he is in the 1860 census. Sad to say, these were the days of slavery, so history buffs will understand that the very fact that Ambrose was in this census caught my eye, because this told me that he was free before emancipation. He was, in the terminology of the day, a free person of color, and that meant that there would be more of a paper trail to follow. And as I followed that trail, I discovered that some of his family had been free for some time back into the 1700s. I also discovered this, a letter mentioning Ambrose Hawkins written by a fellow named Joseph Gray. So who was this Joseph? Turns out he was a friend of Ambrose's, which is a little unexpected given that he was a slave owner. The 1830 census shows him in the house that he built a few years earlier, one that still stands today, with a total of 14 slaves. But Joseph had a religious awakening and decided to release his slaves. However, he didn't simply give them their freedom. Instead, he made arrangements to send them to Africa. You probably won't be surprised to hear that Joseph didn't dream up this idea himself. He got it from the American Colonization Society, which was created in 1816 with the objective of transporting free blacks from America to a colony in Africa. And it had some pretty impressive supporters, including James Madison, Francis Scott Key, Andrew Jackson, and Bushrod Washington, a Supreme Court justice who also happened to be George Washington's nephew. He was the society's first president. So the intention was to send people who had been born in America and whose families in all likelihood had been here for generations to the continent that their ancestors had been taken from, one that was totally unfamiliar to them. As you might expect, free blacks were less than enthusiastic about this. To put this in perspective, consider that 40% of Americans today have ancestors who came here a few generations ago through Ellis Island. Now imagine that someone thought it would be a good idea to send us all back to the countries our ancestors came from. Sponsoring the first immigrants in 1820, the society ultimately sent thousands of Americans to Africa and played a significant role in the establishment of the country of Liberia. With all this in mind, let's return to Ambrose. Remember that letter? In it, Joseph was proposing to the society that Ambrose go to Africa to check things out. If he liked what he saw, Joseph said, Ambrose would come back and spread the word. But why would a man like Ambrose, who was comfortable and well-respected in his community and whose family had been free for decades, if not generations, contemplate going to Africa? This is why context matters so much in history. And in this instance, I mean time and place. The letter was written on September 6, 1831 in Halifax County, North Carolina. Something rather astonishing had happened just two weeks earlier and just across the state line in Southampton County, Virginia the Nat Turner Rebellion. Nat Turner was a slave who felt he had been called upon to lead an insurrection against slave owners. Figures vary, but at least 55 white people were killed in just a couple of days. The rebellion tapped into every slave owner's worst nightmare, and the resulting backlash was fierce. Ultimately, many more blacks than whites lost their lives, and it didn't matter whether you were enslaved or free, you were a target. Add to this the fact that Turner managed to evade capture for two months before being caught. That initial failure to find him kept fear and hostility alive. And because all this was happening practically in his backyard, it undoubtedly influenced Ambrose. So it's no accident that during this chaotic period, a handful of letters were exchanged between Joseph and the society about Ambrose's proposed journey to Africa. It was the immediate aftermath of the rebellion that first caused him to consider going there and the continuing turmoil that eventually led to a fresh decision to take his entire family with him. So it was that Ambrose made his way to Norfolk, Virginia to sail on the James Perkins on December 9, 1831. As a result of some communication hiccups with the society, he was traveling solo without his family. 
But he was far from alone. The Perkins was the first ship to depart for Africa after the revolt, so it's not surprising that this would be the largest group of emigrants to ever go at once. All told, there were 338 on board, and 80% of them were from Southampton. After a five-week journey, Ambrose arrived in Africa. We know this because a fellow passenger wrote a letter to the Society about the delightful passage and of receiving attention and kindness from Mr. Ambrose Hawkins, quite a genteel young man. And we know he returned to North Carolina swiftly in early 1832. We can gather that he was favorably impressed because after receiving Ambrose's feedback, Joseph J. Gray proceeded with liberating his 14 slaves and sending them to Liberia in May of that year. Here we see them listed on their departure manifest. Joseph had praised Ambrose repeatedly in his letters, and it's clear the high regard was mutual because Ambrose named a son born about this time, the one who would go on to become Pharrell's third great-grandfather, Joseph J. So Joseph Gray would only have sent his slaves if Ambrose had liked what he had seen. More to the point, on that same ship with the Grays was the Harwell family, which was also from Halifax County. Almost a decade earlier, Ambrose married China Harwell, and the Harwells on that ship were a collection of his in-laws and nieces and nephews. In other words, he was sending his own family to Africa as planned. For reasons we'll never know, Ambrose changed his mind again and did not return to Africa with his wife and children. Perhaps things had finally settled down after the rebellion, or someone in the family was too ill to make the journey, or, well, who knows what. But even so, it's fun to consider that Pharrell likely has some cousins in Liberia descended from mutual American ancestors. Every one of us is an amalgamation not only of our ancestors, but of their decisions. Ambrose Hawkins changed his mind several times, and had he opted in the end to emigrate, his son Joseph would have been raised in Liberia instead of North Carolina, and the gene pool that would eventually produce Pharrell would never have crystallized. And today, the rest of us would be considerably less happy, and all because Ambrose had a change of heart in 1832. Think your choices don't matter? Think again. Drop alone if you feel